Okay, we're going back to the story of Joseph then tonight, so we're in Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. It's quite a short chapter this. I've called it uh, Joseph a great example. Let's read from verse 1. <clears throat> Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, uh, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favoured. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within, and she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and fled and got him out. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake on him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him, and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Something just strikes me as, as I read through this that I haven't made a note of, um, and that is that Joseph, of course, is destined for great things. Uh, but whenever a man is destined for great things with God, he's first going to be tried. He's first going to have to fight battles. He's going to have to win battles. For example, before the Lord Jesus enters into his ministry, he has that uh, battle with the devil that we read about in, in the wilderness after his baptism. And uh, having overcome the devil there, then the Lord begins his ministry. I'm reminded of Samson, who um, slew the lion, you remember. And uh, when he'd gone down to take the woman, uh, was she, a Phil she was a Philistine, wasn't she, in Timnath. Uh, and he's going down and he, he, he has to fight this lion. And this is before Samson really begins 
I think, fighting against the Philistines. And uh, if a man is going to be useful for the Lord, he must first be tried. And he must first have to win battles. And what is clear here is the first battle and the biggest battle that we have to win if we're going to be of any use to the Lord is the battle with our own sin. And of course, Joseph wins that battle here. Uh, and of course, this just proves his fitness for what later on the Lord is pleased to use him for. So verse 1 we read, Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. Joseph now is about 17 or 18 perhaps when he arrives in Egypt and he's sold there for a slave. Now the word slave hardly ever occurs in the King James Bible. It occurs only twice, I think once in Hosea and once in the book of the Revelation and on neither of those occasions is it spoken of in approving terms. The Bible, in spite of what the atheists keep telling us, my Bible does not approve of slavery. Um, it doesn't even use the word slavery as I say, it's always a servant except for those two occasions where it's not used of, it's not used um, in, an, in an acceptable way if you like it's not used in an approving sense now as for modern Bibles you might find a very different story but not with the old book um, now Joseph doesn't start a movement here called Hebrew Lives Matter uh, but he trusts God and he continues to prosper he's not moping around with a chip on his shoulder um, because he's in a strange country and because he's a slave um, but he trusts God as is evident and he begins and he continues to prosper uh, he was as disadvantaged as many a slave has been since but through faith in God he rose to, ro to rule over the whole of Egypt uh, black people there are sadly still black people who whine about disadvantage and whine about slavery well they could learn something from a man named Thomas Sowell who was ra raised by his grandmother in Harlem and he's now one of the smartest men around very interesting to listen to the story uh, the early days of Thomas Sowell and a great thinker and a very interesting man I'm not sure whether he's a believer he may be it would seem from his writings that he certainly heard the Bible from his grandmother it would appear and he was a black man raised if you will in unfortunate circumstances but he didn't mope about it, he didn't whine about it, he didn't, com didn't complain about the underprivileged blacks he didn't get involved in black, black Lives Matter he set himself to study and he set himself to work and now he's at the top of his profession and a very interesting man he is too verse 2 says the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man now it's clear from the chapter that he was a true Israelite that is to say he was an Israelite who feared God and uh, just one or two places in the Bible which give us counsel on how to prosper one of them is my favourite you've heard me preach on it several times Psalm 1 one of these days I'm going to get this printed up and I'm going to stick it up somewhere in this place I don't quite know where yet it's up my jumper maybe now I shall stick it up so somewhere if nobody objects because I love Psalm 1 and we'll just read the first three verses here blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper so here we have an encouragement uh, an exhortation if you will to meditate in the law of the Lord and of course we have the law of the Lord but we have much more than the law of the Lord we have the New Testament as well you know I've been mentioning this to you of late that I've been corresponding with a Roman Catholic one of his recent questions to me was Jesus, one of his recent points stroke questions was Jesus never told his disciples to write anything the early church he says was to teach because uh, he's trying to play down the importance that we place upon the scriptures you see 
So I began to look, and I might deal with this on Saturday night, I began to look at the amount of occasions or some of the occasions in which in the scriptures men are told to write and I was really blessed as I began to find text after text after text where God said to people like Moses and he said to people like Jeremiah and he said to John the Apostle write these things write the things which thou hast seen and heard he says to Jeremiah write down these prophecies he says to Moses write all the words of this law and then you as you come into your New Testament you find over and over the Lord Jesus saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. Not I am God, listen to me, but it is written. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, um, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And, um, and so there, there is a real emphasis in the scriptures, upon the scriptures, upon the primacy and the importance and the value of the scriptures, and we mustn't miss it. And so I said to this man, uh, writing recently to this Catholic man, I said, you know, when the Lord Jesus was in a conflict with the devil, he didn't say, I am the saviour, go away, depart from me. He said, it is written. Now even the saviour relies upon the word of God to deal with the devil. And I said so, I said as much to this man. I tried to conclude, uh, well I said to him on Sunday, I, I've written 14 pages of A4 in my last reply to this guy and on Sunday I said, we, I'm going to stop here, I said, because we're just going round and round and round, I keep saying the same scriptures to you and you keep coming back with the same objections. Well I've had another, another email from him today and uh, he's going to send me another one tomorrow, but whether I shall reply, we shall wait, we'll have to wait and see how the Lord leads. But Joseph is a prosperous man. And we'll say more about why perhaps in a moment. Have a look at Joshua. That's the sixth book after the law of Moses, the law of the Pentateuch. The book number six, we've got Joshua, chapter one. Joshua, chapter one. And notice again here, we're reading verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of mind. So again, here's the emphasis upon the written word of God. God is telling Joshua, this book of the law, this is the book that Moses has written. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. So Joseph, we read, was a prosperous man. And if you and I want to be prosperous, the Bible tells us that we ought to meditate in the Scriptures. Now, we don't meditate in the Scriptures like certain men in America do in order to get rich. When it talks about prosperous, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that we're going to get rich. We might get rich, we might not. That's not the, that's not the aim. Joseph prospered, he was a servant in the home of Potiphar. He prospered in the prison, he was still in prison. He wasn't rich, but the things that he did succeeded, if you will. Then thou shalt have good success, God says to Joshua. But we read in Psalm 1, and we read in Joshua about the need to meditate in the law. But Joseph never had a Bible. Because this is recorded in the first book of the Bible, which was recorded by Moses, which is one or two or three hundred years later, probably about a hundred or so years later. Joseph never had a Bible. So you and I have a far greater advantage than he had. And if we, only, if we Christians only half understood what a treasure the Bible is and how privileged we are to have it, we might be less neglectful of it. I think many of us may be challenged at the judgment seat of Christ by our neglect of the Bible. Our King James Bible is 90% the work of William Tyndale. Uh, the, exa the, uh, the translators in 1611, they took a number of translations, including Tyndale's, and it's evident if you compare Tyndale, I'm not suggesting you do, you can if you like, but if you were to compare Tyndale's New Testament with the New Testament here, you'll find much of what the King James trans translators have given us is the work of William Tyndale. And he was determined to give the, the Bible to the playboy in his own tongue. And he was burned at the stake for his trouble. It was October, I think, in 1536. 
uh, that he was first strangled and then burned at Vilvoord in Belgium because he wanted you and I to have the word of God and we leave it too long lying on the shelf. Men have died for this book. Men have died so you can read this book. Obviously Christ dies that the book should have some power and some significance in our lives but there's many a saint has died that you and I might have the Bible. And I think some of us are going to be challenged at the judgment seat of Christ by our neglect of it. The modern church ought to be ashamed of its neglect of the Holy Scriptures. John Trapp says, Now when God sees his mercies lying on the table, it is just with him to call the enemy to take away. We're going to get a little bit later, I shall touch a little bit later on, on the martyrs. I've been reading about the martyrs again, the, the English martyrs in the reign of Mary. And we'll see how th this is fulfilled here, what John Trapp has just said. When God sees his mercy lying on the table, it is just with him to call to the enemy to take away. Our judgment at the Bema seat will be according to the light we have received. And England has arguably, arguably had more light than any nation on earth, and, and Pat Curry used to argue even more light than Israel. We have been possibly the most privileged nation on earth as far as the scriptures. This great book which has gone all around the world was translated here by Englishmen when England was a great nation. And it was this book that made England great. It wasn't anything to do with our maritime powers, prowess as some like to say. It wasn't because we had command of the seas as some suppose. It wasn't because, you know, London was a great centre of banking. It was because we upheld the word of God. That's what made the country great. And that's why the country is now going down the drain and going down fast because we've turned away from the book. Verse 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him. Now, both Moses, for example, and Joseph had many years of drudgery, but it fitted them for leadership. Andrew Fuller says, sudden advancements are seldom safe. Joseph himself needed shaping, not just his intellect. He himself needed shaping. There are those these days that make so much of a Bible college education, but it's not nearly enough to fit a man for leadership. You've heard it said, I'm sure you've heard it said many times, you know, these days a man goes to Bible college for 30 years, for three years, and he ministers for 30. Uh, the Lord Jesus studied for 30 years and ministered for three. He didn't start his ministry, of course, till he was 30 years of age or thereabouts. So a Bible college education is not nearly enough to fit a man for leadership, and many a young man has made a mess of his of his life because he thinks what God wants for him is to go to Bible college. Factory work, he thinks, will often be a better spiritual college. One of the greatest making mistakes in Christendom is to think that leadership is intellectual. I always remember, and I've told you this before, I always remember Cyril Baker saying that there was a time among the Methodists when they said what we need in the pulpits is men with degrees. So they put men with degrees in the pulpits and by degrees they entered the churches. Moses thought he was ready at 40 after the best education in the world. Pharaoh was, a, was an amazing civilization. Even today, the pyramids are astounding. The mathematics and so on, the astronomy involved in the building, of the, we can't work out much of it today. We couldn't build those things even today with all the kit that we've got now, with all the heavyweight plant we've got now, we could not build those things. So it was a great, amazing civilization. I'm not saying it was a good one in a, in a moral sense, but it was a big and it was a powerful one. And it was a very learned one. And here Moses was educated in the palace. And yet, though he thought he was ready at 40, he wasn't ready. He had to wait a further 40 years. A young Christian destined for great usefulness may have to wait many years. I've met many an impatient young Christian man, and I was once one myself. A rapid rise might make his head spin, and he'll not be of much use. Sometimes it takes time. In anything, anything really good and worthwhile, it takes time. I've been teaching a girl to drive today. Surprise, surprise. Um, she's had about four lessons. Her brother is leaving her for dead. He's really good, he's got it, but she's struggling. And I said to her today, she's had four lessons or maybe five. I said, did you enjoy that? And she's kind of a, not really sure, you know. And I said, you know, she said, I want to pass. And it's this impatience, and I get this sometimes with them. They think they, need to, they, think they ought to pass tomorrow. 
and because everything's got to be like this in today's society and you can't do it that way you, you know driving's a dangerous business you've got to get it right you've got to get the principles right you've got to learn to control the car i didn't give her this lecture but perhaps i'll think about it and everybody wants to do everything immediately everything's got to be instant it's not like that with god you can't do that do it like that with god and if god's going to use us it's going to take time and it might well take hardship and it will certainly take trials and it will certainly temptations which we've got to come through to fit ourselves to the work verse 5 and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house wherever Joseph's trials led him he improved them as the old saints used to say first he has charge he's in charge in Potiphar's house then we find after he's put into prison he's in charge in the prison look at verse 22 of our chapter and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever did they he was the doer of it the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him that's with Joseph and that which he did the Lord made it to prosper so he prospers in Potiphar's house, he's put in charge of Potiphar's house, he's put into prison, he's then put in charge of the prison, and then of course he's given charge over the whole of Egypt. If you just go on to chapter 41 for a moment of Genesis, and have a look at verse 43, and he made him to ride, this is Pharaoh, and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, we're not all going to be Josephs, but we can all be faithful. My son Dan, when he first went to Oxford, when he was studying for his degree in Oxford, he was working for a travel agent. And he rose very quickly through, very quickly through the ranks, practically second in command in no time at all, because he, the guy just, the, the boss seemed to like him. And he used to have the job of hiring and firing people to work for these travel agents, my son Dan did. And he said the pride of the people that used to come along, the, the, the absolute arrogance of the people that used to come along to be interviewed, they would know absolutely nothing. What they knew about the travel industry, you could have got on the back of a stamp with a half inch border, but they were so sure that they would have got and Dan said, I don't waste my time with them, you know. I'll give him short shrift and send some packing. Now, that, that, those are not quite his words. But he was horrified at the, the, the hubris, the puffed up way these kids come along knowing nothing, thinking they're going to be a great gift to the business. Of course, most of them never got the job. And uh, we need to accept, you know, sometimes uh, we're not going to be Josephs, we're not going to be Moses, we're not going to be Peter, we're not going to be Paul, we're not going to be the great leaders of the country, we're not going to be the massive... Uh, what shall I, explosive Christians that we once thought we were going to be, but we can be faithful, and we ought to be faithful. And God will bless us for our faithfulness, certainly in this life, and, all, and certainly, I was going to say almost certainly in this life, and certainly in the next. Verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. The devil hates to see the godly prosper. Now, Hellier Street has been blessed. We need to be on our guard. We are seeing some blessing. John frequently reminds us in our prayers that the devil's not going to like this, and we need to be on our guard. And if we will keep in mind as a church that we prosper only by the grace of God, this will save us from the pride, which is often the snare of the devil lie with me she says now Egypt is the world in the scriptures and Mrs Potiphar is an Egyptian and she represents I think the feigned and illicit love of the world which is the ruin of most men and women the world wants people to think it loves them it doesn't love them at all it's run by the devil and Joseph uh, sorry John warns us in his epistle if you look to first John with me John's first letter he warns us about the world and its allurements to use a word of Jane Austen's nice word good descriptive word 1st John chapter 2 
obviously if I'm looking at the right book and verse 15 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him but all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever now we saw the same kind of woman in our, in our recent uh, messages with Samson we saw the same kind of woman in Delilah the Philistine who would lie with Samson but would sell him in a moment it says Samson loved the woman it doesn't say as I mentioned to you when we were looking at it that she loved him she sold him and he wound up blind of course they put his eyes out he wound up uh, grinding and uh, you know grinding corn for the Philistines let's have a look for a moment at uh, Proverbs chapter uh, chapter 7 because we have a good description here of, of the world as a woman if you will and certainly false religion which we'll touch on a little later Proverbs chapter 7 I've said to you before I'm always saying things to you that I've said to you before but then the Bible does that doesn't it and we have to, one of, the, one of the reasons that Bible studies are important is because we need to be constantly reminded of the truth of God. We shouldn't be saying, well, I heard that a year ago or I heard that six months ago. We need to be constantly reminded about the truth of the Word of God. The devil is in our face every day. The same temptations will often come to us, if not daily, certainly weekly. And we need the same truth that God should speak to us regularly. And it's a good thing to come, even with a preacher like me, I dare say, it's a good thing to come because we have the word of God. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 7. My son, <coughs> keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman. Think about the world here. Think about false religion here. That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. Passing through the street near her corner and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She's loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day I have, paid, have I paid my vows. See, she's religious. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. 
One commentator says here, what begins with soft lights, sensuous music, perfumed bodies, passionate embraces and drunken laughter can very well end with scalpels, oxygen tents, braces, wheelchairs, bills and burials. That's so true. But we need to be as resolute I need to be and you need to be as resolute as Joseph was against sin what does he say here in verse 9 there is none greater in this house than I neither have he kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God now I'm going to do something right here that I don't think I've ever done here we're going to pause for a moment and we're going to pray so let's just have a moment's prayer Father we pray that we might not just treat the Bible as an interesting book we pray Lord that we might not just treat the Bible as something with which to win our arguments we pray Lord that we might not just treat the Bible as a promise box as they used to do but we pray Lord that we might take seriously the warnings of scripture and understand that we are called to uprightness of life we are called to soberness we are called to righteousness we are called to faithfulness and we can read about Joseph Lord and we can enjoy the story and we can see his example as she was how he was kept from this woman but we Lord need to realize that we face this woman every day and we are constantly being allured one way or another into worldliness and we would ask thy grace O God to be faithful we would pray to, that you would give to us Lord this resolve that Joseph had how can I do this wickedness and sin against God we pray O God that you'd make us a holy people not just a knowledgeable people we would be a knowledgeable people but we must be a holy people and we ask our God that you would challenge us when we need to be challenged about words that we speak and deeds that we do that do not come up to the kind of standard that befit a Christian we ask Lord that you would help us all to be in earnest about living uprightly and not just being students like that man James speaks of who sees his face in a mirror and goes away forgetting what kind of man he was father fasten these things upon our hearts and may we be resolved that until the saviour comes we will by god's grace live uprightly we will by god's grace study his words we will by his grace hide his words in our hearts that we might not sin against thee we ask these things in jesus name and for his name's sake amen some men and i've had it said to me they accuse the bible of being sordid uh, because of a story like this or maybe because of the story we looked at last week where uh, Judah um, committed incest with his unknowingly of course unwittingly with his daughter-in-law but as one commentator says acts of impurity are never glamorized in the Bible awful sins are spoken of throughout the Bible but they're never approved of and we find so often as Moses said be sure your sin will find you out we find those things happening in the scriptures we find a man committing a sin and we find him so often in the pages of the bible getting his comeuppance getting his judgment we've seen this as we've studied the life of jacob for example so the bible never approves although sometimes we see things that are not pleasant they are not approved of in the scriptures they're there for a warning so Joseph says how can I sin in, as we read together in verse 9 how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God and we need to understand that sin is basically against God David in Psalm 51 repenting in that psalm over his sin with Bathsheba says against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight I used to be amazed at that it was a dreadful thing that David did Uriah Bathsheba's husband was was fighting on the front line for David while David sleeping with his wife 
and then David invites Uriah home, gets him drunk, in the hope that he'll go and sleep with his wife, and any forthcoming children Ur Uriah will think are his. But he won't do it because he's a good soldier, and he says, I can't go to my wife while, uh, while the other soldiers are out in the field, and he sleep, slept outside that night, you remember the story. And so David then arranges of him killed. Even the best, this one, another one of the proofs, isn't it, that scripture is true because even the best men are not whitewashed. You're told the truth, and you're told the truth about David, who was a man after God's own heart. But I used to think David says against thee and thee only. I used to feel terrible for Uriah. I think, what a way to treat Uriah, and yet he says against thee and thee only have I sinned, he says to God. But of course, sin is against God. And more than, more than the sin he committed against Uriah, it was a far greater sin in the sight of a holy God. Once the world has rid itself of God, which is doing everything it can to do, it's rid itself of sin. And so things that we know to be sinful and to be wicked, the world just thinks are fine now. And we're bigots and we're prejudiced because we say these things are wicked. They get rid of God and they get rid of sin at the same time. And so you hear them speak sometimes of joyless puritanism, <coughs> which I suspect is an oxymoron, and hidebound Victorian morality. But they will reap what they sow. The time is coming, of course, when they will reap what they sow. The, ang the answer to England's ills will never be political. I'm not sure quite why I put that in there, but it's, it's a point worth reiterating. The answer to England's present hill ills and Britain's present ills will never be political. Brexit is not going to put things right. The problem with this country is moral. The problem with this country is the rejection of God. That's the problem. And that's the problem. It is our privilege, one way or another, however the Lord leads you, that's, our, that's, that's the problem. It is our privilege to address we could do far more for this country than any politician in Parliament because the real problem is a moral problem. The real problem is a need of an awareness of God and awakening to the truth of God. Now, I don't expect England's ever going to be converted. But nevertheless, we should be seeking to win souls while we're waiting for the Lord. One man once said, I've said it to you before, moral corruption is the harbinger of political overthrow. Now, I don't want you to fall out with me and I'm not going to go political here. You can believe what you like, but I don't think Brexit's going to happen. I think we're going to be told it's happening, but it's not going to, I don't think it's going to happen because the country stinks from top to bottom, that's why. And moral corruption is the harbinger of political overthrow, and it will come. Book of Revelation tells me there's going to be a one world government. It's coming, and it's coming fast. And I don't think Brexit's going to stop it, and I don't even think Donald Trump's going to stop it either. Now, I voted for the Brexit. But we have so many liars now in our parliament, I don't think it's going to happen. But that's not Bible, so you can do what you want with that. You might think as you please. Verse 10 then, And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph, day by day. And so is the world persistent with us. The Saviour says, take up thy cross daily. Today's devotion will help tomorrow, but we need, by the grace of God, to be as resolved to walk with God tomorrow as I hope we have been today. And if we have sought to walk with God today, it will help us tomorrow. And I think it will help to remember in our fight with the world, amidst all these constant temptations, it will help to remember that the Lord Jesus may come very soon. That's a real encouragement to me. You know, when you look at the, the unpleasantness now and the wickedness in our nation, it's an encouragement to me to know that the Saviour's coming back. And I do personally believe, I don't know whether we all believe it here, but I do personally believe in a literal, physical reign of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And I'm looking forward to it. Because then the Bible says, righteousness is it righteousness shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and then there'll be true government and then wicked men will be dealt with in a moment according to the book of matthew as a help to us in our battle with the world the lord jesus says let the evil for the day 
be sufficient. I've told you time and time again, that's wonderful psychology. Let the evil for the day be sufficient. The song goes one day at a time, Lord Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Sometimes I'll get overwhelmed with, with the unpleasantness of the nation. Sometimes overwhelmed with whether, whether I can keep on fighting. But I say to myself, just one day, just one day, let the evil for the day be sufficient. And that's a great help. It's a great help also to separation and devotion when we can see the world for what it is. If we can discern the iron fist beneath the velvet glove, we shall do as Joseph did and we shall flee from it. The way totalitarianism is going to come in, it's going to, the people are going to, they're going to want it, they're going to accept it, they're going to be told it's good for them. They're going to be told we're doing this for you when in fact it's an iron fist under a velvet glove and the population will not know until it's too late. Paul writing to Timothy says flee youthful lust. Look at verse 12 of our chapter. She caught him by his garment saying lie with me and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Flee youthful lusts Paul says to Timothy. Now those kind of immoralities are a greater temptation to young men but the world knows how to seduce older men and women too. There's more to temptation than mere sexual lust. There are all kinds of temptations that the world will throw at you. Delilah, Potiphar's wife, call her what you will. And we will not be free of this woman's overtures until Jesus comes and changes these bodies of ours. So I hope you understand that the lesson here for us is far greater uh, than the sexual lusts that are, that are spoken of here. John outlined it as we read in those few verses from his epistle. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John Trapp defines that as pleasure, profit, and preferment. And there's many an old man that might not have you know, much fire in his cellar as far as women are concerned anymore, but he still wants to be, he still wants to make a name for himself. He's still full of pride, he still wants to be somebody. Or he has lusts maybe after money and we know the love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 14. In fact, let's read verse 13 to get, to get the flow. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto, to, to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. So seduction having failed, she turns to wrath. I think it was 1697, I can't remember the title of a book, a man called Congreve came up with a phrase you'll know well, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And that's what we find here. And this is exemplified by the Roman Catholic Church and by radical Islam. The early Christians were murdered, as is well known, by the Roman emperors. I was reading this week how that Nero used to cover the early Christians in tar, stick them up on stakes and set fire to them, and then he'd race round naked in his chariot for his amusement. They were thrown to the lions, as we're well aware. Christians suffered terribly at the hands of political Rome, em em empirical Rome, for about 300 or so years, or maybe a little more. And then when the Roman Catholic Church was formed, Christians again were murdered and tortured everywhere. Hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned and Rome often refers to herself as a woman as, as we see these pictures of Mary everywhere. In this country as recently as 1555 to 1558 Christians were burned alive at the stake by Bloody Mary. Those stories of the noble army of martyrs make for inspiring reading. Yesterday was the 21st of March, that was the anniversary of the burning of Thomas Cranmer in Oxford. Thomas Cranmer was one of the first to die at the stake in the reign of Mary in 1556. And if you ever go into Oxford, as you go in from Birmingham, you come off the motorway, you go in from Birmingham, you come down the main street, right in front of you, just before you turn right to the Randolph, there's the Martyrs Memorial. And there's three men on that memorial, there's Hugh Latimer, 
Nicholas Ridley and Thomas Cranmer, they were all burned in Oxford by Mary, 1555 and 1556. And I thank God for a monument like that. We need to remember, I think, men like that. One of the things that really amazed me in one of the Brethren churches where I used to wor worship was that they were not the slightest bit interested in the martyrs. I once suggested that we had a bonfire because as far as I was concerned the deliverance of this country from the papal plot in 1605 when Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the king was something we ought to thank God for not in the least interested not in the least interested in Latimer, Ridley, Hooper, Bradford, Cranmer not in the least interested I thought that was really strange I still think it's really strange those martyrs I was telling Sean and Mimi on Sunday as we went up the town what I was struck by recently reading about some of those martyrs again is how they prayed for England just before as they stood bound to those stakes before they perished they would pray for England Tyndale in 1536 I've mentioned burn in Belgium prays for Henry VIII Lord open the King of England's eyes it was very shortly after that that the chained Bible, the King James Bible, no, it wouldn't have been the King James, it would have been the bishops or, uh, I can't remember which, was put in all the major churches all over England at the command of Henry VIII, who probably wasn't even a Christian. But Tyndale prayed at the stake, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And all of the martyrs, these great men and women who died in 1555 through 50, so many of them prayed for the country before they went up in flames and God has blessed us but now the Church of England is an abomination it's a joke, it's a laughing stock those men were most of them Church of England ministers <laughs> things have changed, things have so changed but Potiphar's wife seems to picture not only the, the godless world but also as I say apostate religion which always persecutes real believers just as radical Islam does today it seems to me at the moment at least it appears to me that radical Islam is taken over where, where Rome left off but not only does she hate him she flatly lies about him she takes his garment and she uses it to lie to her husband and so we oughtn't to be surprised if we are slandered for our faith again the martyrs when they were, before they were burned, the Catholic bishops used to cross-examine them and abuse them and ridicule them for the things they believed. And the thing that the, the martyrs mostly were burned for was they denied transubstantiation. One of the teachings of Rome is that the bread and wine is turned actually and literally into the real body and blood of Christ. And because the reformer says it's not, it's bread and wine, that was the reason they were burned. And I've had just to write to this Roman Catholic man and say your mass is a blasphemous fable and a dangerous deceit. That's what the Church of England used to call it when they had some men of God in the church. And, uh, you know, he obviously thinks it's okay, but it's an abomination. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. A place where the king's prisoner was bound. His contact here with the king's butler in this prison was later to lead to his release unknown to Joseph the Lord was opening the way up even here the, where the king's prisoners were bound he meets the butler there the butler later tells the Pharaoh about Joseph and Joseph before you know it is ruler over all of Egypt verse 21 but the Lord was with Joseph Joseph might have been tempted, mightn't he, to think otherwise, after all he'd gone through. Thrown into pit by his brothers, taken down into slavery. Used as a slave or a servant in, in Potiphar's house. Then thrown into prison. He might have been tempted to think that the Lord wasn't with him at all, but his conduct suggests that he continued to trust in the Lord, because he kept on prospering. The old saints used to say, despise not any man's meanness, that is his low station in life, we know not his destiny. And some people in history have had cause to regret the hard time they gave to someone who later rose to great authority over them. In a little while, when Joseph is released, Potiphar and his wife might have cause to regret their conduct. We don't know. Joseph 
seems to me to, to have been a kindly man so far as we can tell and we don't, we're not told that there were any reprisals against Potiphar or his wife but they'd have thought twice wouldn't they if they'd have known that he was going to be the head over all of Egypt despise not any man's meanness we know not his destiny you know I don't know where I was I think I was in the town centre maybe or close to town and I saw a guy sitting with his blanket wrapped around him on the, on the bridge there or where he was side of the road you know and uh, it's so easy to, to look down on such people um, but you never know what's put in there you never know what that person has had to go through you know we we tend because society does to be rather scathing towards beggars but you never know what he's gone through that's put him there who knows and who knows where he might be a year two three years from now if things could be very very different despise not any man's meanness we know not his destiny for Joseph and for you and I the way up is down we should humble ourselves if we would wish to be exalted if we exalt ourselves we should be humbled the way up is down we ought to be thankful to God for any service as long as it's from him and he will reward he will reward appropriately either in this life but certainly in the next I'm going to give the last word to John Trapp and speak just once more about one of the martyrs, John Bradford. Trapp says this, A prison keeps not God from his. Witness the apostles and martyrs whose prisons by God's presence became palaces. The fiery furnace, a gallery of pleasure. Bradford, after he was put in prison, had better health than before and found great favour with his keeper who suffered him to go whither he would upon his promise to return by such an hour to his prison again so John Bradford was one of these men that was burned by Mary and John Trapp is telling us that he was so in favour with the keeper that the keeper used to go out as long as it came back when the prison was shut <laughs> so, just, like, just like Joseph um, now I don't know whether you're interested in the martyrs I, I remember years ago um, I used to sell books in the street before the council stopped it stopped anybody doing it Christian books in the street and one of the books I had was by John Charles Ryle who was one time Bishop of Liverpool in the late 1800s called Five English Reformers and it was about John Bradford Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley uh, Hooper I can't remember his first name and uh, I've just got a hold of a little booklet which I'm hoping to make available so hopefully that will be willing to uh, be available soon I'll make it available to you for nothing but I suggest to you that that is a real strength to your faith to read about the great martyrs, the noble army of martyrs and we'll close it there tonight. Amen.